we're used to Christian fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, etc. But um, these are scientific fundamentalists, and um, they're, uh, fundamentalists of all kinds need certainty, and they need the certainty that the mechanistic worldview is the truth. And so questioning it is, in my case, seen as heresy. This week on Reset, we are going back to the beginning with Professor Rupert Sheldrake. He is the author of many books, including The Science Delusion, and he joins me on the line now. Rupert Sheldrake, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Glenn. Now, you first came on my radar screen uh, when I read about the most controversial TED Talk in TED Talk history, and uh, you are the most controversial TED Talker. Um, People are still talking about your 2013 talk. Um, Why has it caused such a stir? Well, the TED Talk was about my book, The Science Delusion, which has just been reissued in a new edition here. And the talk was called The Science Delusion. And what I do in this book and what I did in the talk is to summarize the 10 dogmas on which contemporary um, science is based and show that if you actually examine these dogmas or assumptions in the light of science itself, it turns out science has grown out of them. So what I'm doing really is showing that science has grown out of the philosophy of materialism, which has been the kind of orthodoxy of science for over 100 years now. Um, But most scientists and most people outside science don't realize that uh, these assumptions are essentially philosophical assumptions, not scientific assumptions, and that the evidence uh, has taken us beyond them. For example, the assumption that uh, nature is a machine is just a metaphor. It's not a proven fact. And the, uh, and the metaphor that nature is an organism, the Big Bang's like the hatching of the cosmic egg, the universe is like a growing organism, is actually a better metaphor for the universe than the machine. Um, the idea that nature is purposeless, uh, which is a st- standard assumption, evolution has no purpose or meaning, follows from the idea that nature is a machine. Machines have no purposes of their own. Um, and so I go through these 10 assumptions. Now, these are very much part of the belief system of atheists. Most atheists that I encounter are materialists, full, you know, committed believers in the materialistic worldview. The materialistic worldview is basically that the cosmos is all there is, was, or ever shall be in, in Carl Sagan's terms. That's right. The the doctrine of the materialistic uh, worldview is that the universe is a machine. It's made up of unconscious matter. There's no consciousness beyond the universe. There's no consciousness within the universe because matter is unconscious. Then, of course, there's the problem that we are conscious. Um, So some materialist philosophers try to pretend that we're not. They say that consciousness is an illusion or a meaningless epiphenomenon of the activity of our brains. But the trouble is to dismiss consciousness as an illusion uh, doesn't really explain it because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. Hmm. That's why the very existence of human consciousness is called the hard problem in philosophy of mind, because in a materialist universe, it ought not to exist. Right. And um, so anyway, that is the doctrine. The universe has no purpose. It's a meaningless machine. Um, Evolution has no purpose or direction. Um, human consciousness does nothing, there's no free will, and uh, we uh, simply say and do what our brains make us do, and our brains are basically computers. Um, And of course, when you die, it all just goes blank. Um, This is the standard materialist worldview, which is more or less implicitly or explicitly taken for granted in the educational system, in government, in business, and in the secular world. And it purports to be scientific, but what I'm saying is that actually this is a philosophy. The philosophy uh, existed before it got adopted by many scientists. Um, It's a philosophy of nature and it's not the only one. Um, And um, there's no reason science should be a wholly owned subsidiary of mechanistic materialism. 
I mean, you've used phrases like belief system there and doctrine and philosophy. Do you really think that scientists um, portray or assume a belief system? Is it an alternative philosophy? Is it an alternative worldview? Is is modern science almost religion-like? Oh, it's definitely religion-like. Um, it's uh, it's religion-like for those who've rejected religion. And so it's their belief system that replaces a kind of religious worldview. And it replaces it by saying that all religions are nonsense because there's no such thing as God or consciousness beyond the human level. Therefore, they're all illusory and just superstitious survivals of, a, of the dark ages. Or so that's the usual kind of view. Moreover, they do nothing but cause conflict and trouble. Now, of course, when they make those kind of historical arguments, they ignore the fact that the Soviet Union under Stalin and China under Mao Zedong and Cambodia under Pol Pot were atheist regimes, um, uh, which caused you know, hundreds of tens of millions of Yes. So uh, as soon as you look into these arguments, it's not as straightforward as these talking points seem. But it is definitely a belief system. And the reason that my TED talk caused such upset was um, the, the people who were most against it, who attacked it, uh, particularly two American bloggers, P.Z. Myers and Jerry Coyne, both of them uh, sort of Richard Dawkins type militant atheists. And they were very upset about my talk because they thought that that atheism equals materialism, materialism equals science. And what I was saying is materialism doesn't equal science, which knocks away, if it's true, if what I'm saying is true, the pillar of their whole belief system and their whole atheist worldview. And so obviously their response to that was anger uh, and um, instead of arguing with me on the points I'd made, they attacked the TED organization, said that my talk was pseudoscience, they discredited their organization and they shouldn't have it on their platform, they should take it down, which foolishly they did, um, which then led to a great controversy. Um, but the which, reason- which almost proved your point in some senses. I mean, the, the strength of their feeling about this surely points to some underground religious beliefs or religion-like beliefs for them? Yes, I think I think they are kind of quasi-religious beliefs. They're sort of, um, yes, uh, and they're very dogmatic beliefs. And basically, they're scientific fundamentalists. And, you know, we're used to Christian fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, etc. But um, these are scientific fundamentalists. And um, they're, uh, fundamentalists of all kinds need certainty. And they need the certainty that the mechanistic worldview is the truth. And so questioning it is, in my case, seen as heresy, uh, since I'm a scientist. And, um, and that produces usually a very uh, emotional response. You need to be excommunicated, as it were. Exactly. And uh, I mean, I, when I talk to religious people, I very rarely encounter this kind of dogmatism. I mean, it's true that I don't live in Texas. And um, it's also true that I don't hang out with Islamic fundamentalists. But um, most religious people I meet, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, um, are far less dogmatic than, uh, than uh, believers in materialist science. Hmm. Now, those who've heard this story so far, if this is all they've known about Rupert Sheldrake, they might conclude, ah, Rupert is not himself a scientist. Um, so can you um, let us know some of your um, scientific credentials? Because in, in speaking against science in this very dogmatic s sense, that is not at all to say that you're not committed to the scientific method as a way of investigating the world. Um, tell, tell me something about your scientific background. Well, I, I am a scientist. I spend... I spent most of my career doing research science, and I'm, that's what I'm doing now. I mean, I've got an experiment going on today that I need to attend to after our talk. And um, I'm writing papers for peer-reviewed journals on plant development at the moment, which is one of the fields in which I've worked. I started out, um, I did science at Cambridge. I did philosophy and history of science at Harvard. And then I did a PhD at Cambridge in developmental biology, working on plants. Um, I was then a fellow of Clare College, Cambridge, and director of studies in cell biology. 
Um, and so I was teaching biology, lab classes, supervisions or tutorials, um, and um, doing research in plant development, publishing lots of papers in Nature and other peer-reviewed journals. I then worked in India um, in an, an international agricultural research institute, um, ICRASAT in Hyderabad, um, working on the improvement of chickpeas and pigeon peas, uh, legume crops which are used by millions of poor farmers in the semi-arid tropics. Um, so, and then um, during this period, I underwent also a spiritual um, journey. I started off as a standard atheist materialist. My science teachers at school made it clear that uh, as far as they were concerned, science equals atheism and um, science equals progress, reason, uh, leading humanity forwards, religion equals superstition, dogma, uh, priestly indoctrination, holding humanity back. And if I wanted to be a scientist, I should be in the vanguard of humanity as an atheist and a scientist. Well, I bought into that worldview, which is very flattering for scientists because it makes them feel that they're in the lead of the whole of humanity and mm. leading humanity out of a dark age that, you know, uh, that it's been trapped in and so on. Anyway, so I bought into that worldview um, and what began to go wrong was that I be, began to question not the atheist part, but the scientific part of it, because I thought this was much too limited a view of living organisms, that animals and plants are more than mere machines controlled by molecular mechanisms and genetic programs. It simply didn't explain the facts of developmental biology. That's what I was working on. So I got interested in the uh, more holistic approach to biology came up with the idea of morphogenetic fields which shape form of developing plants and animals and which have a kind of memory given by a process I call morphic resonance. So I developed this idea when I was at Cambridge of a kind of memory in nature, um, which is obviously a controversial view. Most scientists assume that the laws of nature are fixed and that they were there at the moment of the Big Bang and they've been the same, uh, always will be the same. This is actually a hangover from 17th century theology when God was seen as the maker of the world machine uh, and he was seen as an engineer and a mathematician fixing the laws of nature. So curiously, most scientists are ardent believers in an outmoded kind of <laughs> theology. Sort of deist uh, kind of. Yes. So anyway, um, I got um, interested in this new approach to biology. I knew I couldn't publish it until I thought about it a lot more. When I was in India working in agriculture, in my spare time, I was working on the idea of morphic resonance. And then um, I also got interested in consciousness. So when about 1970, I took um, LSD and LSD completely changed my view of consciousness. Instead of seeing it as just something produced by a computer-like brain, um, I, I had an experience, a kind of near-death experience really, which opened me up to the idea that there was this vastly greater realm of consciousness. And that interested me in exploring the mind without drugs. Um, so I, in about 1971, I took up transcendental meditation and meditated and, uh, daily and, and did yoga. That led to an interest in Indian philosophy. And that's one reason I took a job in India, um, because I was so interested in the Hindu philosophy. Um, in India, I also had a Sufi teacher in Hyderabad, where there were quite a number of Sufis. Um, but in the course of my time in India, I became drawn back to my surprise to a Christian path. Um, I, was, I refused to get confirmed at school. I was the only boy in my high Anglican boarding school that didn't get confirmed in my year. But I was confirmed at the age of 36 in the Church of South India, the Anglican Methodist ecumenical church in South India um, and then found that the um, kind of Christianity I encountered there was didn't seem to have much depth on the spiritual side compared with the Hindu tradition with all that meditation and then I found a remarkable uh, Christian uh, teacher Father B. Griffiths who had an ashram in South India a Benedictine ashram he wore the orange robes of a holy man and the ashram was sort of vegetarian and you sat on the floor and we chanted 
uh, we had an hour's meditation morning and evening. And Father Bede was, uh, had a deep understanding of the Upanishads and the Hindu approach. And for me, um, this would provided a essential bridge. He also introduced me to something no one had ever taught me about before, namely the Christian mystical tradition and the kind of uh, mystically based theology of the church fathers and of the medieval scholars. And so I was reading Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure and uh, medieval Christian theologians who have much in common with the Hindu philosophy, but nothing in common with the mechanistic worldview. And mm -hmm. so I reconnected with the deeper and more mystical sides of the Christian theological tradition through Father Bede. And th so this led me to um, an approach that combined spirituality with uh, uh, following a, a, a Christian path uh, with regular Christian practice, you know, prayers every day, going to church, fasting in Lent and so on, which are all things I do today. Um, but this was, um, it, it, so I came, it, I came to it through a very unusual route. Well, maybe not that unusual nowadays. A lot of people develop an interest in Eastern spirituality uh, before they find themselves drawn back to rediscovering um, the riches of the Western tradition. Hmm. So none of that discovery of God and religion and spirituality made you think, I need to leave behind my science. What was it that sort of sent you back into the lab? Well, I really believe in science as a method of inquiry, you see. I think science is the best method of inquiry we've got for um, exploring the natural world. Um, it, because it's cumulative, you have a build-up of knowledge, you have um, a process of hypotheses, you suggest a possibility. For example, I'm suggesting the idea there's a memory in nature through the idea of morphic resonance. But then you test it. I mean, I'm doing an experiment right now to test it. What is the experiment right now that you're doing? Um, well, it's, the experiment says that if organisms sur survive a challenge, then it should make it easier for others to survive the same challenge. Right. And to put, put it in um, epidemiological terms, it, it might mean, I can't claim it does mean, because there's no evidence for this yet, but it might mean that if lots of people overcome COVID-19 with their antibody response, it'll make it easier for others to overcome it. Mm, wow. The hypothesis predicts also that if rats learn a new trick in one place, rats all around the world should be able to learn it quicker. Hmm. So what I'm doing at the moment is some experiments on plant growth uh, in, with high temperature shock. Um, and if they can survive, some of them survive much higher temperatures than usual does it make it easier for others to survive the same high temperature shock in the mm -hmm. future? So I don't know the answer. I'm in the middle of the experiment right now. Right. Um, right. So um, these, the, so morphic resonance is a testable hypothesis and uh, it's not something that's a matter of faith or an act of, you know, belief. It's a possibility. A hypothesis is about a possibility that you test. And it may be wrong, it may be right. And <clears throat> the beauty of the scientific method is that you can actually test an idea like this. And if there turns out to be a lot of evidence that there really is this kind of memory in nature, this leads to a change in the way we interpret biological inheritance, normal biological memory. Um, the laws of nature can be seen as more like habits, could lead to a, a major difference in the way we interpret nature scientifically. And so in that sense, science is progressive, it can move forwards. But like all human institutions, uh, it's subject to human failings, including dogmatism, you know, people in power not wanting to give it up and so forth. Um, right. So uh, the sociology and the philosophy and the, the history of science are not one of completely rational, objective inquiry. Uh, a lot of people in science don't like new ideas and proclaim them heretical. So um, it's always a struggle. Scientific revolutions, changes in scientific thinking have always involved debate and struggle. Um, but that's part of the process. And so uh, though I find myself in, engaged in quite a number of um, arguments with fellow scientists, I, I think that's part of the scientific process too. And yes. um, so I'm completely... 
I would hate to give up science because it's it's the thing I most enjoy doing. And I really do feel that the scientific worldview has completely changed our view of nature, not in a way that reduces it. If you take the idea that of nature as a machine, mechanical, unconscious, it reduces nature to machinery. And it also reduced the god of the world machine in the 17th century to an external machine-making engineer who designed the universe, then pressed the start button and left everything to work automatically, and occasionally intervening uh, through suspending the laws of nature to create a miracle uh, in historic, you know, in in the time of the Old and the New Testament, but no more. And that was the kind of stripped-down version of Christianity a lot of people had. And it's the version of Christianity that most atheists reject. It's a view of God I reject myself. Yes, yes. When people say, do you believe in an interventionist God? I say, well, no, because I don't believe in a double-decker universe in which on the ground floor it's all about cogs and levers that are pulled mechanically and then perhaps upstairs there's some freaky stuff that happens. And spiritual people might go upstairs every now and again. Mm. I don't happen to believe in an upstairs thing. Um, when people say, do you believe in an interventionist God? They're kind of saying, do you believe in there's an upstairs compartment that is weird, but scientists have cleared away that kind of nonsense. Well, I think that's the revolution in thought that happened in the 17th century. Rene Descartes, in his famous dualism, said the mind and uh, the spirit, mental, conscious life is totally separate, not in space and time, from nature, which is extended matter that's totally unconscious. Therefore, the mind and the body are separate. The realms of religion and science are separate. And humans and animals are separate because we have conscious, rational minds and animals don't. They're just machines. That's why we can use them in factory farms and genetically engineer them. Um, so, and that's the view which has actually persisted as the underlying view of our whole culture. Um, although science itself has moved on from that or should be moving on from it. And yes. the uh, depths of the Christian and all religious traditions um, have never had the idea of God as totally external to nature and like a machine uh, maker engineering the universe and pressing a start button, it all works automatically. That was never a traditional Christian, traditional Christian view. It arose in response to this mechanistic view of nature in 17th century science. Right, and yet perhaps sometimes Christians need to accept some guilt um, for, for this, in that the scientific revolution um, erupted in the Christianized Protestant West. Um, I wonder if you see any kind of rebuke to Christianity and any kind of links between this Protestantism that gets rid of, you know, the saints and Mariology and transubstantiation and increasingly strips back the dogma that perhaps that same spirit becomes a hyper-Protestantism that gets into the scientific method that chips away and away at the stuff that is spiritual and religious. Is, 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 that, is, is it our fault? Oh, I think there is, Glenn. Yes, I think the, the point is that the disenchantment of nature, which science brought about, um, was actually prefigured in the Protestant Revolution. Um, the, the Protestant Reformation rejected many aspects of, uh, of medieval Christianity, which was basically animistic. Medieval Christianity was animistic in the sense that um, Christians then believed that nature was alive, animals and plants had souls, the stars and planets had souls, they were living intelligent beings. They were heavenly bodies. Heavenly bodies. Um, um, and, and we still call the planets by the names of the old gods and goddesses. Um, so. The, 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 in the Middle Ages, St. Thomas Aquinas, in his theology following Aristotle, said the earth is a living organism, animals and plants have souls. So animals are called animals because anima means soul in Latin. And that humans have souls too, but we have a level of soul that animals don't have. Their souls are about instincts, emotions, behavior, emotion, the senses. Um, um, plant souls are about developing form. We have that in our embryology and in the maintenance of the body. We have animal instincts, animal souls. In addition, we have rational minds, which is the distinctively human aspect of the human soul. Um, when Descartes 
um, brought about his separation of these realms in the 17th century, he abolished the category of soul. You just had matter and, and movement on the one hand, and conscious minds which were rational uh, on the other. And animals and plants became just machines like the whole of the rest of nature. So I think that this Christian vision in the Middle Ages um, was, it, the whole world was animated and many pre-Christian practices had been incorporated into the Catholic worldview, including pilgrimages, um, going to holy places, recognizing the seasonal festivals and sacralizing the, the year throughout the year. At different turning points of the year, there were festivals which linked the religious and spiritual life to the life of nature. Now, the Protestant didn't like any of this. They abolished uh, pilgrimage. So going to holy places, walking through the land on sacred journeys uh, was stopped. It was considered, uh, you know, too Catholic. Um, <coughs> the cult of holy places was suppressed. Um, many of the festivals were abolished. They even tried some of it during the 17th century, the Puritans even tried to abolish Christmas. Um, so uh, the, this um, disenchanted the world and, and removed the realm of, of the divine spirit from nature, where in the Middle Ages, God was in nature and nature was in God. And, and, the, um, and that produced these wonderful medieval cathedrals, the, this animistic philosophy and seeing God in nature, nature in God. And um, it created these marvelous Gothic temples that we still have, thank goodness. Um, but after the, um, this scientific revolution, after the Protestant Reformation, God was, it was all about the relation between God and humans, and nature was at best a neutral backdrop, if not the realm of the devil. And so there was this withdrawal from nature and much more interiorized, uh, individualized uh, vision of spirituality. I mean, it has its strengths, and the, this liberation was in some ways a, a real liberation from what could have been oppressive superstition. But it also, uh, by disenchanting the world, made it possible for the scientific revolution to come along and say, well, yes, well, nature is nothing but machinery. God's not in it at all, except as the creator in the first place. And it all works unconsciously and mechanically. Um, and then that, of course, led to deism in the 18th century, the idea of God's nothing but a supreme creator. No point praying to God or going to church because God's not going to intervene to answer your petty prayers about your mundane concerns when the whole of nature is just a smoothly running machine. Um, so I think that that Protestant view combined with the scientific revolution has got us to this where we are today, the idea of the nature is nothing but a system of mechanical unconscious processes that are there for us to exploit. And that of course has led to the ecological crisis. As, and, 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 um, and that's one thing fortunately that's forcing us to reevaluate our relationship with nature. Mm, yes. What would you point to if we want to re-enchant the world for ourselves and if we want to have a grander vision for reality and nature, um, Obviously, theologians and preachers can talk about it from the theological side of things, but maybe even from the scientific side of things, what kind of experimental data would you point somebody to, to say, hang on, the mechanical view is, um, you know, this idea that we're just billiard balls clacking together. It cannot account for the world that we actually experience. What kind of scientific data would you point somebody to? Well, I would say the, the, the biggest challenge for the mechanistic worldview is the existence of consciousness. Right. And what's happening in the debate about the so-called hard problem, the very existence of human consciousness, um, is the, that materialist philosophers have for 50 years or longer, almost 100 years, tried to deny consciousness. It's just an epiphenomenon. It's nothing but another way of talking about brain processes or it's an illusion. And none of these theories are very satisfactory. And what happens is they fall out among themselves. One of them says it's an illusion and the other says, well, actually that doesn't really explain it. It must just be an epiphenomenon. They say, well, you know, then if you're saying it doesn't do anything, why is it evolved? Because everything that evolves should have a utility. 
according to Darwinian evolution. So you can't just assume something like consciousness will evolve that doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't do anything, then they're caught in a terrible dilemma. They go round and round uh, in the hard problem. And as a way of dealing with that, uh, and, and, and studies of um, near-death experiences, uh, changes in brain function during mystical experiences with psychedelics and so on, reveal that there are indeed changes in the brain, but they don't explain the subjective, the conscious experiences that people actually have. Mm. Now that is forcing a uh, change in the way that neuroscientists and philosophers of mind think. And as you know, within the last 15 years, there's been a remarkable panpsychist turn in, in psychology and in philosophy. And what the panpsychists are saying is basically a new version of animism, rebranded. Um, and what they're saying is, well, if there's a little bit of consciousness in electrons and atoms and molecules and in cells, then the appearance of consciousness in human brains isn't a difference of kind, where consciousness suddenly appears out of nothing. It's a difference of degree, where uh, all of nature may have some level of consciousness, awareness, or experience, even electrons and atoms. Mm -hmm. And so that's one area where empirical research on consciousness and uh, debating about the nature of consciousness is actually leading to a philosophical change. Now, some of these panpsychists are hoping that by saying matters conscious to a limited degree, even in atoms and electrons, they're hoping they can retain materialism as a worldview by expanding it to include consciousness. The trouble is that uh, it doesn't really uh, remain materialism. It's really disguised animism. Hmm. And if one follows through the logic of the panpsychist argument, then one could say, well, is the sun conscious? Um, personally, I think it might be. And hmm. you know, I've recently written a paper on this, which is going to appear in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. So I'm hoping this debate will be taken up in academic philosophy and, uh, and... A paper they would not have taken as seriously 20 years ago, do you no, think? No, well, it wasn't. I mean, it was a challenge to get it approved through the peer review process. One of the peer reviewers was very keen on it. The other was rather hostile. And I had to jump through quite a lot of hoops and do quite a bit of rewriting um, to get it approved. Um, but basically, you see, if you say electrons are conscious, which panpsychists do, and you know, molecules and things, and that human brains are because they're so complex, then why not the sun? You can't, mm. panpsychism means psyche or mind or experience everywhere. Right. And so what it can't just be business as usual for the sun and the galaxy. And if the sun's conscious and has a kind of mind, so do other stars. And if, if stars have them, then the whole galaxy may have a kind of mind. And if galaxies have minds, then what about the whole cosmos? And if the whole cosmos is conscious, if there's a kind of soul of the world, that's something people in the Middle Ages believed in. It was a key, key part of their theology. So we're then, through a few simple steps beyond existing materialistic type panpsychism, a whole new debate opens up, a whole new way of seeing nature. Um, it would lead then to, if, if you said, well, the whole universe is conscious, but consciousness stops there, that would be a kind of pantheism. Um, um, but if you say, well, consciousness may transcend the universe, and for those who believe in a multiverse, which some scientists do, many universes, there may be a consciousness beyond all of them, and um, so we then come to an idea of consciousness within nature and beyond nature, which for which the theological term is panentheism. God panentheism, right. And, and everywhere and in. Um, and which in Acts chapter 17 in the New Testament, Paul says, uh, in God we live and move and have our being. Which And he was actually quoting some of the Greek poets. So this, this panentheism idea is... Yes, in him we move and live, move and have our... Yeah. Exactly. And I think that this was a very deep sense of the way that theology saw nature, particularly, I would say, perhaps more in the Eastern Orthodox than in the Western tradition. But nevertheless, in the Western tradition, and, and certainly in medieval theology and in uh, pre-medieval theology through um, Dionysius the Areopagite, a very influential sixth century writer, uh, this vision of 
the whole universe is animated and alive and the angels as intelligences guiding the stars and the planets and uh, guiding nature and the whole of nature pervaded by intelligence. When our ancestors looked up at the sky at the time when they were building cathedrals here in England, they didn't just see empty space with uh, hydrogen bombs floating around in mm. it. Um, they saw um, a, a, a space that was full of God's being. The heavens. And, and that where the stars and planets had angelic intelligences associated with these heavenly bodies. It was alive, it was intelligent, and uh, the entire cosmos was filled with the being of God. Mm. Right, right. It's full of the glory of God, and the heavens declaring that glory of God, and day after day they pour forth speech, says Psalm 19. Um, there is an intelligence. They display knowledge in, Acts, uh, in, in Psalm 19. You know, we look up into outer space, and we see this black, cold, dark emptiness, lifelessness. Yes, and when children learn about when children learn about the skies, they don't actually go outdoors at night and look at the stars. They, mm. It all comes from textbooks with pictures of space probes and machines going up into huh. space. Yes, that's interesting. And if you watch YouTube videos on you know how grand or vast the universe is, it'll start with Earth and it'll go up to the solar system and Milky Way and then beyond. The soundtracks are fascinating because it's usually kind of Mahler's Fifth Symphony, like, but done on a yes. synthesizer, and all you're meant to do is to be awed by the size, the magnitude of it. It's just meant to make you feel small. Whereas I think the ancients would have looked up into the heavens and they would see that they were involved in some grand dance of life. Yes, they were connected with the cosmos and... and with God through the cosmos, because God was in the cosmos and pervading it. And the, then there were all these other levels of intelligence within the cosmos, the angels. It wasn't like a totally unconscious universe, conscious humans and conscious God and nothing in between. The whole of nature was filled with life, intelligence and uh, and meaning. Right. So in this series, we're going back to the beginning and, uh, you know, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God creates, creates the heavens and the earth. But in verse 2, the earth is formless and empty. Darkness is over the surface of the deep. It seems to be waiting for something while the Spirit of God hovers over the waters. And then verse 3, God's word is pronounced and then the whole show gets going. Absolutely. I mean, this is so, I mean, uh, so when I'm talking to Jewish friends about this, I point out this isn't just a Christian version of interpretation. It's right there at the very beginning of Genesis. You have no form and void. It's without form and void. And the Spirit of God blows or moves on the face of the waters. Well, sort of brooding like a mother hen? It's that kind of language. But mother hens, as they they move, and there's a movement in it. And as soon as you have a movement of wind or breath over the water, then you get waves. So, you know, what science tells us is that ultimate or physical reality is ultimately wave-like. It has this wave aspect. Quantum particles, light itself, is, has this wave-like aspect. And so we have, at first, a kind of primal wave-like principle of movements and, wave, and waves. And then... The waves take form and God says, let there be light. And then speaks, uh, dividing an initial unity, dividing into light and darkness, sea and dry land, is going to take a primal unity and creating by division. Um, well, that, I think that the most basic metaphor in all this is speech. Um, word is speech and breath is like wind and pneuma, ruach in Hindu is breath or wind or... Um, so I think the basic model is, for me, what makes most sense is actually just thinking about our own speech. And I'm a speaker right now. I'm saying words which have form, structure, hopefully meaning. And there's also a, a flow of breath. If I have just the thoughts in my mind, they're silent. They're in my mind, but they're not expressed in the world. If I have just the flow of breath, there's a flow of energy, but no structure meaning it's white noise if i can if both are combined together then i have something that's changing uh, moving um it, it's a dynamical principle in it but it's not random that movement is is shaped by the words the movements the muscles of my mouth and vocal apparatus are giving form to this flow <coughs> and so 
Um, I think the model that the beginning of Genesis is inviting us to consider is, is precisely this model of breath and wind and speech, which we all directly experience. And mm -hmm. it's showing us that there's a fundamental principle in nature that's, first of all, conscious. God is, there's a, God is a conscious being. And when God first mm -hmm. talks to Moses about himself in the burning bush and he says, who are you? He says, I am who I am. Mm. That's conscious being in the present. It's the most simple and concise view, okay, expression of the idea of conscious being in the present. Mm. Um, and so this model of the Holy Trinity says God is conscious being, the fundamental ground of being is conscious. That's what the Hindus mean by sat in sat, chit, ananda, that there's a fundamental being of the universe is sustained by God and his conscious being. If God ceased to exist, the universe would disappear instantly. So God's not just some who starts the world off in the beginning and it works automatically thereafter and has nothing to do with it. Right. And he's in some transcendent supernatural realm. Yes. The ground of being, and that ground of being is expressed through both forms, which we see all around us and in all our thoughts, Nama Rupa, the Logos. Um, and then the dynamical principle of the spirit, energy, flow, change, breath, mm -hmm. wind, um, fire, light. Um, right. So uh, it, for me, this, this theological view um, is not incompatible with the scientific understanding of nature. In fact, I think it's completely compatible with it. it, it, it in fact, I think they illuminate each other. Yes, right. And could it perhaps even be fruitful for further investigation? Because this dynamic God creates a dynamic world. He says, you know, let let the water do this and let the earth do that. And and there's actually movement and dynamism within the created order. That it's not just this mechanical cogs grinding along. And this seems to be language logos is at the heart of all this that's that's woven into the fabric of the world if we took that seriously perhaps there'll be further scientific discoveries along the way do you think i'm not well i think it would shed a light on the creative process um the the thing is that the what you see when god says let the earth bring forth the, the plants that give fruit after their kind and mm -hmm. stuff um I think what's so important there is that God is not only um, a creator of the earth and the heavens is sort of bringing them into being, but then empowering them. Let the earth bring forth. God doesn't say, I'm now going to go to a design lab and design every animal and plant like a machine and then put it on the earth. He empowers the earth to, and the seas to bring forth fish. And so the story of the creation of life in Genesis chapter one is one of the empowerment of nature to be creative. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not direct creation, it's what Roman Catholic theologians call mediate creation, that God empowers nature to be creative. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think creationists are so very misguided in their interpretation, attempt to interpret Genesis in terms of a literal machine making God who, who makes and designs machine like animals and plants basically they have bought into the machine world view of mechanistic science and they're trying to fit god into a mechanistic world view which i think is a terrible mistake and and um um i don't uh, so they think that nature can't be creative in its own right well evolutionary theorists say it can and i think they're right about that um but what they can't do is explain the creative process itself, because even if you take the literal view of inheritance through genes, as in neo-Darwinism, um, uh, it doesn't explain why new things appear in the first place. It doesn't explain how animals and plants adapt to their environment. And what we're now seeing in evolutionary theory is that the creativity of animals and plants in adapting can actually be inherited through what's now called epigenetic inheritance. Uh, it's not all in the genes inheritance. There's uh, animals can inherit the learning of their ancestors. It, recent experiments with nematode worms have shown that if you flavor their food with a chemical they don't normally encounter, benzaldehyde, they learn that benzaldehyde means food and they wriggle towards it. If you do this for four generations of nematode worms, for the next 30 generations at least, they go on 
wriggling towards benzaldehyde. In nature, if they'd learned how to recognize and use food source and their offspring had immediately inherited that ability, you'd have a creative adaptation that's inherited. And that's what happens. Whereas under neo-Darwinian old style, Richard Dawkins type selfish gene evolutionary theory, the ability to recognize benzaldehyde and to associate it with food would happen by a random rare mutation and over dozens of generations of selection that gene would become more frequent until uh, this random event that happened to be purposive and useful became predominant in the population. What the recent research shows it's not like that at all. Creative adaptations can be inherited directly. The creativity that's inherent in animals and plants in adapting to their environment through their form and their behavior um, can be part of the evolutionary process straight away. And this has led to a revolution in evolutionary theory. The, the, uh, the new evolutionary synthesis um, goes way beyond old style neo-Darwinism because it admits the inheritance of acquired characters or epigenetic inheritance. And this brings a purposive, adaptive creativity much more into the evolutionary process. And then if you say, well, how do animals and plants act so creatively? You could ask the same, how do humans act so creatively? And we just don't know. I mean, people who have new ideas, creative artists, people who have inspirations of one kind or another, say things like, it just came to me in a flash, or I saw it in a dream, or I just knew, or suddenly I realized, mm -hmm. or uh, where does it come from? And our ancestors thought it came through, the Greeks thought it came through the muses, yes. which mm -hmm. were angelic type beings that inspired us. Um, you know, in the Christian world, the inspiration could come through saints or angels or through Jesus Christ or, um, or directly from God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so there's, uh, when we see there's a kind of creative influence in all nature, then instead of having a God who designs and creates a machine at 6, 6, you know, 13.8 billion years ago in, in the Big Bang and then presses the start button. Um, the, um, instead of a God who does all the creation at the beginning and sets up all the laws of nature which thereafter never change, we have a creativity that's going on in human life and in the natural world through the entire evolutionary process. We have an imminent creativity in nature. And I think Genesis 1, when saying, God said, let the earth bring forth, let the seas bring forth, is telling us that there's imminent creativity in nature whose source may ultimately, is ultimately, according to that account, God, uh, the divine being. But it's a delegated creativity embedded in the natural world, which is perfectly compatible with, and indeed seems to require an evolutionary vision of reality. Hmm. Delegated creativity that we participate in. Now, I'm very aware you've got a scientific experiment that you've got to check in on, uh, Rupert. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much for that. If people want to catch up with you uh, more, what can they read? Where can they visit online? They can go to my website, sheldrake.org, um, where I have uh, many, many um, podcasts. So I've been doing a series of discussions on science and religion with the philosopher Mark Vernon. We've done so far 55 podcasts, so we've covered a huge number of topics. Anyone who's interested in these questions can see more there. And my book, The Science Delusion, as I mentioned, is now available in the new edition. And, and my two most recent books on science and spiritual practices um, <clears throat> sorry about this, I just, that's Science and Spiritual Practices. And this is ways to go beyond and why they work. Each one deals with seven different spiritual practices um, which have been scientifically studied. And the reason I'm so keen on this is because I'm a scientist and I have spiritual practices which uh, are within the context of my Christian faith. Um, but the practices themselves are things that people can do within or outside a religious framework. Things like meditation, prayer, gratitude, um, pilgrimage, singing and chanting, uh, fasting, um, and indeed sports, which I think is uh, the modern, main way in the modern world in which people are, achieve altered states of consciousness. You, huh. Sports force people 
into the present. And a lot of spiritual practice is about being in the present. Meditation is about that. And if you're going downhill on skis at 60 miles an hour, you have to be in the present. I mean, if your mind wanders and you start worrying if you paid the go bill or what you should have said to someone who insulted you or something, you go over a cliff and you're dead. I think the appeal of a lot of sports in the modern world is precisely because it shuts down the discursive mind, which is one of the aims of many spiritual practices. So I think we've achieved on a huge scale, a kind of secularized spirituality through sports in the, in the modern sense. Fascinating. World. Anyway, one look the, at what the fans are doing in the stadium. Are they not worshipping as they chant and sing? Yes, yes. It's a, it's so it has a spiritual dimension. I think, so I think part of my aim in these books is to show that our everyday life can have spiritual dimensions to it. Hmm. Um, anyway, those are, if anyone wants to follow up, those, those, uh, those, I have a YouTube channel as well. There's a link to that from my website. Excellent. We will put that in the show notes, sheldrake.org. People can catch up with you there. But Rupert Sheldrake, thank you so much for joining us on Reset. A pleasure.